good afternoon, progressive. Wow, I guess we're all progressive pet parents. I'm not in the progressive pet parents group though. Good afternoon, pet parents of Regina. Welcome to Furry Friday. Um, you can see that it's a little bit different today. <clears throat> I'm not cruising around the store with my phone because, so here was my thought, what I wanted to talk about today on Furry Friday. Um, first of all, are you guys like, is everybody working? People have DOs? You're gonna let me know, but if you do let me know, it's a little bit, you're still gonna comment like you normally do. We have a comment here. <laughs> Twyla, hello queen. Why am I the queen? I'll be the queen. Is it because you're watching The Crown? <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Anyways, not right now. Um, so anyways, you can see that we look a little bit different today. I'm not walking around the store because it was my intention to talk to you guys about why feeding a little bit of raw is better than no raw. And we got the perfect product. Here we go, you guys, the Primal Raw Toppers. It's just a little bag, two pounds, I believe. Yes, two pounds. Comes in a variety of proteins. And this is a super easy way to add just a little bit of raw to your pet's diet because this is for cats or dogs. So this was my intention. I was going to talk about this. Now Miss Ella will take that and put that back in the freezer for me. Um, and then I got a message the other day from one of our customers. And what she was asking about was, could you talk about on, on a furry Friday, could you talk about why most vets don't recommend raw, but we, as well as many other pet stores, do recommend raw. So um, now sometimes this can be a little bit of a touchy subject, but I want everybody to know without a doubt I have all the respect in the world for vets and we make sure everybody knows we are not vets. We are making recommendations on natural holistic health options to fix common ailments that we see in our pets, whether that's itchiness or yeast or some things that traditional kibbles can aggravate or inflame. So the reason that I'm back here, this is what I wanted to tell you guys, is I started making out some notes about why, like what I wanted to tell you about this. And I wanted to make sure that I had all my stuff straight. I talk about this lots in the store when folks come in and we talk about different things. Um, we have some fantastic, fantastic vets in the city. Obviously, Zayner and I go to the vet, and we have some fantastic vets in the city. And this is absolutely in no way whatsoever meant to be any type of a slam at any of our vets. And, and in the vets, in all of our vets' defense, they are medical experts of the body, of, of our furry guy's body, right? So very much just like when you and I go to our doctors, the MDs, they are medical experts in the body. And if I said to my doctor, well, hey, doc, I, I need to talk about my nutrition. Like, I, I need to talk about how much meat should I be eating? How many vegetables? How many? He's going to say to me, or she, <laughs> my MD is going to say, go talk to a nutritionalist. I'm here to fix the problems that happen in your body. I'm not the guy that tells you what to put in it. That's a nutritionalist's job. Or a doctor that is extremely focused on nutrition. That's only get one day of training in vet school specific to nutrition. And once they've paid their thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to go to vet school, why would they ever come out questioning the knowledge that they've been taught? The concern that I have with the one day of nutrition training that they get is who it's provided by. Their one day of nutrition training is provided by two of the biggest pet food manufacturers in the world, Hill Science and Royal Canin. 
So we're going to talk about that a little bit later because I also put together a little bit of a slideshow so you guys don't just have to watch my mug on the screen. Um, but so I, I wanted to talk about why we recommend raw and then why, you know, you're going to hear different vets saying don't feed a raw diet. They have some legitimate reasons, but then they also have some reasons that are based out of fear and that fear is usually created by the big pet food manufacturers. Okay. So you guys, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. And we're going to take a look at why our vets don't recommend, or most vets, I shouldn't say all, why most vets are not usually recommending raw feeding. Okay. One of the biggest reasons that vets typically don't recommend raw feeding is due to the fear of salmonella. Okay. Salmonella is a bacteria, E. coli, you've heard of these things. Um, but here's what's funny. In our food, in the grocery store, meat that we would eat, chicken, for example, in the grocery store, grocery stores, chicken that we eat, grocery stores that sell the chicken that we would eat, they're allowed, it, it is allowed that there can be up to 10% occurrence of salmonella on the chicken that we eat. But on the raw pet food side of the house, zero. There is zero tolerance for any occurrence of any bacteria. So we can eat it. <laughs> They're okay if we eat it, but not the pets. Now, the reason that salmonella isn't the big deal that is made out to be by the dry pet food manufacturers, and they're never going to tell you this, 75 times more salmonella is found in dry food than it is in raw food 75 times that means for every one pound of raw pet food that is recalled due to some sort of bacteria 75 pounds of dry food is recalled for salmonella or bacteria so you're probably thinking well how is that possible it's dry it sits there it's not raw meat you're right but if you've been in the store, we've talked about this. We've talked about kibble being fresh in the bag until the minute that we rip that bag open and the fats in the food are exposed to light and air. And when the fat is exposed to light and air in a kibble, it starts to oxidize. And when that fat starts to oxidize, it starts to rot the food. So it is almost more important. I want everybody to be keeping their pets dishes and utensils and anything that they're using to eat from or drink from. I want everybody to be keeping that clean. But it is even more important that we clean things that kibble goes in. Because oftentimes it can sit there, not just for the duration of the meal, for the day, right? Some pets not interested in their kibble. They'll go and they'll eat it. And then we leave it sit there all day. And then maybe they eat it that night. And then we fill it up the next day and we're, we're not washing it in between. So there's more chance there that we would get bacteria from a dry food. And the statistics are in. It's 75 times more on dry food than raw food. But the big pet food manufacturers of the world say, oh, Mm, raw meat full of bacteria you know like what do we do when we cut up chicken or steak or pork or or anything that we are going to eat you don't just then leave the the cutting board and the utensils there and not wash it you practice safe handling of foods we need to do that with our pets foods too um but one of the biggest reasons that vets are saying do not feed raw is because of the fear that has been created by big, big pet food of the bacteria. This is just a little side note as well. Our dogs and cats, because they are born meat eaters, they have a very acidic stomach, much more acidic than ours. On a pH scale, they have a stomach acidity of a level two. That's the way that mother nature intended because if they're out in the wild and they come across a carcass 
that may not be fresh and there is the potential for some bacteria, their bodies are actually equipped to handle bacteria far better than ours are. But yet in the grocery store, we can be subjected to up to 10% occurrences of bacteria in like a chicken, where in the raw pet food space, they say zero tolerance. They could probably handle the 10%. We should have a zero dollars, but we don't. Um, okay. I went off on a little bit of tangent. I talked about, too, um, the one day that vets are provided for nutrition. Sorry, you guys. I've ruined my slide there. Just a second. Ugh. All right. Oh, I'm going to get rid of this, too. Oh, you guys. I'm just a mess. And I suppose you can all hear Zayner screaming in the backyard, background, it's backyard. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, so this was, my, this was my chicken slide. I apologize, you guys, now I'm behind, I'm just talking. Um, okay, so this is who is providing the training for our vets when they go to vet school on nutrition. Hill Science and Royal Canin. Okay, so there's a little bit of a conflict there because not only do they provide the training and say, oh, you must eat an O cell, O, 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 because this food will fix that and that food will fix this. And we've talked about this before too, you guys. There is no medicine, there is no type of medical ingredient in any prescription diet that would fix an ailment. None. If you flip over a bag of prescription food, you will see the majority of the ingredients are things, one, not fit for human consumption. We wouldn't eat it, but the big pet, fad man blah, 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 big pet food manufacturers say, feed it to the animals. I say, no, I disagree with that. If I couldn't eat it, why would I give it to Zane? If you look at a lot of the prescription diets on the market, the closest thing we're getting to meat is a byproduct or a fat source um, or a byproduct meal, okay? Byproducts, again, are the products that are not fit for human consumption. Meal is when we've taken some sort of a protein and made it into powder. So a byproduct meal is something that is not fit for our consumption and then we cook the crap out of it to turn it into a powder and that's what the protein source is in the food so there's no there's no medicinal property whatsoever to a prescription food um, i'm going to give you an example most times with prescription foods that are specifically supposed to address an organ issue like a kidney or a bladder or a UTI, right? Urinary tract infection, uh, kidneys. Did I say that already? I probably did. Sorry, Zayner is distracting me. <laughs> okay, most, most prescription foods that are designed to address an organ issue have a higher salt content. Again, we've talked about this in the store if you've been in here, and we've talked about what's referred to as the salt divider. In regular, non-prescription dry food, salt can only be 1% of the entire bag. So anything, and those ingredients are listed in order of size. So anything listed after salt, less than 1%. In a prescription food that is designed to, address, to address organ issues, what they do is they increase the amount of salt in that bag to make the animal thirsty, to make the animal drink more, to flush the organs, okay? So salt is not a medical property. Salt is not a medical ingredient. Salt just makes us thirsty, okay? Uh, another example, if it is a weight loss food, okay, a food designed to help the animal lose weight when they're overweight, that food has cellulose in it. What is cellulose? Cellulose is essentially sawdust, okay? So again, if you think about it from our side, um, is there one food out there that we could eat to lose weight? Here's the food that you will eat for the rest of your life, 
so that you can lose and maintain your healthy weight. There isn't. It doesn't exist for them either. The food contains cellulose, which is sawdust, so it fills them when they eat, but it's not nourishing them, okay? Look at the back of those bags. I have gone off on a tangent. Okay, um, I'm going to switch my slide, you guys. All right, I wanted to show you this. If you've been in the store, you've seen this poster in the store. Here are four of the top 10 pet food, uh, four of the top 10 biggest pet food manufacturers in the world, okay? Mars bar, chocolate bars, Smuckers, known for jam and jellies. Uh, Nestle, again, another chocolate bar manufacturer, and Colgate Palmolive. So they make soap and toothpaste. But those are four of the top 10 biggest pet food manufacturers in the world. Take a look at who makes Royal Canin. Their prescription pet food is made by Mars Bar. Now, some folks are going to say, Psh, who cares? Lots of big umbrella companies make all the products. So what difference does it make? Well, to me, where I think this is an issue is if you've got a product portfolio that is so extensive that you're making everything from chocolate bars to prescription pet food, you're not really in it for the quality so much as you are for the quantity. That's my concern. And when we look at the ingredients on the back of the bag, we can see that they're not about quality when we're feeding corn and wheat and chicken byproduct meal and chicken fat um, or byproduct fat. Like, okay. Um, so, Hills, manufactured by Colgate Palmolive, Royal Canin, manufactured by Mars Bar. Yes, they, I'm sure they have specific departments dedicated to their pet food, but those are the guys that provide the vets their nutrition training. So they're going to come in and they're going to say, if you have an animal with a kidney issue, if you have an animal with a bladder issue, if you have an animal that needs to lose weight, if you have an animal that has gastrointestinal issues, here are the foods. Sell the foods. They're, they're, they are some of the least nutritional foods on the market for our pets, but they also come with one of the biggest price tags, okay? We have to know what's going in their bowls. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier too. Our vets, well, here I go again. Our vets, just like an MD for us, they are trained on the medical side of the body. They are not trained in nutrition, not unless that that completes veterinary school and then takes it upon themselves to go and study and study and study because there's a lot of information to know about nutrition. And I know that when I first started studying nutrition and I certified myself in pet nutrition as well as raw nutrition, my jaw was on the floor for weeks because I was absolutely floored at the information that I was learning also felt awful that if I could have made every single mistake possible with my big dogs, I did. And it wasn't because I didn't want to do right by them. We all want to do right by them. You know that as well as I do. But we don't know what we don't know. And so I, the things that I didn't know are some of the things that I specifically say to my folks here. You think back to when you didn't know as much as you know now. What do you wish somebody would have told you with regards to your pet's nutrition? And that's where we're always trying to draw back that curtain, create that transparency, and allow pet parents to make educated decisions about what's going in their, their pet's bowl because there were so many things that I didn't know and so many mistakes that I inadvertently made thinking I was doing the best for my big dogs. And, and I made every mistake I possibly could have made. And I want to help prevent other pet parents from making those same mistakes. So this is why we do the things that we do. This is why I put out different posts about different parts of pet food and, and all the things I want you guys to know because I don't want anybody making those mistakes unknowingly thinking that they're doing the best for their pet and then 
find out that they're not. Okay. Um, so I would say another one of another one of the big reasons that vets, most vets are opposed to a raw diet. They're not necessarily opposed to a come. Okay. I shouldn't say that. Some are not necessarily opposed to a commercially made raw diet, but they're more opposed to the homemade raw diet and rightfully so, unfortunately. Um, we've talked about this before. In most cases, when folks are making their own raw diets for their pets, they are absolutely doing it with the best intentions at, at heart, right? They, they're wanting to do the best for their pets. They want to cook for their pets. They don't want to feed, you know, unknown ingredients in a bag. They want to know what's going into their pet's bowl. So they start home cooking or preparing their pet's meal. The reason that the vets are concerned about this, the reason I say rightly so, is because when we cook for our pets, and, and by cook that literally means you know, if you're doing a raw diet, you're chopping up meat and bone and organs and all the things and you're putting it in a bowl. You're not actually cooking because when was the last time you saw a wolf standing over a barbecue? They don't cook. They don't cook. They eat raw. So when we're cooking at home for our pets, it is usually raw food in a bowl. The reason that vets are concerned, this is also a concern that I share with them, is if we don't balance that meal entirely making sure that we are providing a complete balanced raw meal at home we run the risk of them feeding our pets an unbalanced meal which is the absolute worst thing that we can do for them so in order to balance that meal we need to include everything that mother nature would include okay if we think about it again our little furry guys are out there left to their own devices hunting and killing and eating the things that they do, they eat everything from tail to nose. And Mother Nature intended it that way because there is a purpose for every part of their prey that they eat, okay? So when we are preparing raw food at home from scratch, we need to include obviously the meat, regular meat, organ meat, bone, all of the macronutrients which are essentially that all of the micronutrients and this is where it gets very tricky how much vitamin e how much calcium how much phosphorus how much zinc how much magnesium you need to know all of that so th there's there's tons of people that do it don't get me wrong there's tons of people that do it it is time consuming and if you think you've got a great recipe town packed you may find that after a couple months of your pet eating this, they're starting to lose their hair. What the heck happened? They have these funny dark spots on their skin. What the heck happened? They're red in between the pads of their toes. What the heck happened? It could very easily be a micronutrient that you somewhere along the lines of your recipe, it has been missed. So we're feeding that unbalanced diet. That is the worst thing that we can do for them. Okay, so I get it when vets are saying, oh, don't make your own food. Some people are very good at it. Um, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of knowledge, and you've got to make sure it's balanced. You've got to make sure it's balanced. Otherwise, we're doing the worst thing for them possible. Okay, I think finally, kind of the last thing that the, the reason that vets are not, um, oh, yeah, I keep doing that, you guys. Uh, one of the last things that vets probably, um, why they don't want to recommend a raw diet is because there have been very few feeding studies done on raw diets. Now, I'm going to explain to you what a feeding study is. I'm also going to preface this by saying that feeding studies are extremely expensive. Um, and the feeding studies that are conducted today are done by the big pet food manufacturers of the world. Here's where I think there's another little bit of a conflict. They host their feeding studies. They're never going to release a study that says, oh my God, our food is awful for your pet. So they're only going to release the results of the good feeding studies, okay? 
Um, the other thing is they're never, never going to say to a raw pet food manufacturer, here, let us do a, a feeding study on your food and we'll see if it beats our food. They're not doing that. They're doing feeding studies on the brands that they manufacture. One more thing about feeding studies. As a pet food manufacturer, once you have passed a feeding study for regular mainstream kibble, not prescription, regular mainstream kibble, once you've passed a feeding trial, or feeding study, whatever you want to call it, and you want to make a prescription food, you don't have to do another feeding study. You already passed on this side. Go ahead, make your prescription food. Okay? That's scary to me. Um, so what is a feeding study? So in a feeding study, it is a six-month study. So the testing duration is for 26 weeks. It has to have a minimum, which normally that's all it has. It has to have a minimum of eight healthy dogs at their optimal body weight. Then they are fed the food that is being studied. And as long as no individual dog gains or loses more than 15% of their body weight from when they started the trial, and as long as the entire group of animals does not lose or gain more than 10% of their overall cut, like combined weight, they consider it a success. And just an FYI, it has to start with a minimum of eight, but 25% or two of those dogs can be removed from the study for non-nutritional non reasons. So really, only six dogs for six months have to eat a food and not gain or lose more than 15% of their body weight for them to say, this is a healthy food. I, it, does the look on my face say it all? Because, well, oh, anyways, that's a feeding study. So there have been, there haven't been six month raw feeding studies done like that. Okay. Um, raw food studies are gaining some popularity. Some raw food manufacturers are also gaining some credit, I guess, with some vets. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. One of the most relevant raw food studies that is being conducted right now is being done in Helsinki by Dr. Oh, look at me and my bad slides. I don't know why I did slides for you guys. I, I keep forgetting that I need to advance the slides. Um, by Dr. Anna Helm Bjorkman. Oh, I can never say the name right. Anyways, Anna and her team are in Helsinki and they are doing studies where they take dogs, test subject dogs, um, dogs that were all dry fed and dogs that were all raw fed and dogs that were some dry, some raw. Um, and then they start to change the amount of raw in the dog's diet. And now they are then able to provide those, those technical medical results that the, that the other vets are looking for. Uh, blood pressure, blood sugar, uh, white blood cell count, red blood cell count, like all of the details to say this is a healthy, thriving animal. And it happened when we increased the amount of raw food and decreased the amount of dry food. Okay, they're doing awesome studies. Anna and her team were also the ones that did a bunch of testing with regards to dogs being able to smell COVID. This woman and her team are amazing. Okay, so the benefits of raw as we know them, and we've talked about this with you guys if you've been in the store. Um, the biggest thing, and I'm going to talk about this because this is one of the biggest myths out there. We, we've got to feed them a crunchy food because it cleans their teeth. And I, in fact, I did a furry Friday on this specifically. Remember I ate Doritos. 
Okay. Because saying that they have to eat a crunchy food to clean their teeth, their teeth, their teeth is like me saying to you, eat Doritos the rest of your life. It's crunchy. You don't need to brush your teeth. Then the crunchy food will clean your teeth. Doesn't even make sense, right? Here's why crunchy food doesn't clean their teeth. And I know that there's also prescription dental food out there. They're bigger chunks. Well, of course, they have to chew that a little bit. But they're not chewing up here, right? They aren't put that at the back and they try to crunch with their molars, just like we do. We, we, we don't chew steak with our front teeth. Like, anyways, you guys. So our mouths, our jaws go back and forth because we are chewers. Our dogs and cats' mouths go up and down, up and down. That's the, that's the way their jaws were designed because their jaws are designed to rip and swallow, rip and swallow. And if we've done all the ripping by feeding them a dry food, then they just have to swallow, 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 right? They might crunch a little bit, but they're just swallow because that's their nature. Dry food, usually your traditional dry food has a very high carb count. Carbs turn into sugar. Sugar not only feeds disease, but it also sticks to the teeth. Think about it. You've gone into a bakery, you've grabbed a great big icing filled cupcake and you chomp down on that. And now do your teeth feel clean? Not when you're eating something really sugary. Raw meat provides the necessary enzymes to actually break down the debris on their teeth. Raw foods, raw manufa manufactured raw foods, commercially manufactured raw foods also include bone. And bone is helpful for cleaning their teeth. We've talked about that before too, right? When they chew on a raw meaty bone, that is mother nature's toothbrush. That is what's going to clean their teeth the best. So when we're feeding them a commercially raw diet, there is bone included in that diet, which will help clean the teeth. <clears throat> Another big difference you're going to notice when you start incorporating raw into your pet's bowl is how soft and shiny their coat becomes. A lot of these benefits are in both raw and freeze-dried raw. Now, raw is the most biologically appropriate diet that we can feed, but sometimes raw is also a lifestyle change. I am awful for trying to remember to take frozen food out of the freezer the night before. And Zaner is not waiting 15 to 20 minutes for it to thaw. Let me tell you that. Um, and, and the reason I say that for him, a bigger dog, if it wasn't thawed meat and it was still kind of frozen, that's okay. Not for smaller dogs, like a Zaner size guy, because he's got such tiny little delicate organs that if he's eating raw meat, and it doesn't thaw as he scarfs it down because he does gobble snarking is what I call it. And when he gobble snarks his food down and it doesn't thaw, that could cause problems, okay? Because his body can't break down this raw frozen meat. Bigger dogs, because they've got bigger organs, it isn't, I mean, some dogs will eat the frozen raw food. I'm sure that Zayner would if I let him, but for little guys, we don't want to do that, okay? Um, the other thing about our raw or our freeze-dried raw is, is how it, their body uses all of the food. The example that I use with this is when we're feeding a dry diet, think about us. We go to a, a great big delicious Chinese buffet and we eat and eat and eat and eat. And then like a half an hour later, we're like <laughs> hungry. I was stuffed a half an hour ago after I ate all my delicious Chinese buffet but now I'm hungry again. It's because there's a lot of things in there that our body isn't using to nourish us. It just tastes really good. Same thing with kibble. Kibble manufacturers know this. That is why they spray some sort of a palatability flavoring onto this dry styrofoam-like food to make the cats and dogs think, mm, I love this. They love the taste. Uh, they love the sugar. They get addicted to sugar, though they shouldn't eat sugar, they get addicted. That's what they love. 
but their body doesn't use all of that food. You got to remember that if 50 to 70% of everything that we put in that bowl is uh, carbs that their body isn't eating or that their body isn't using, they're only getting half of what we put in that bowl. So if they eat two cups a day, one cup their body will use, the other cup comes out in your backyard with a raw or a freeze-dried raw diet because we've cut those carbs down to nothing. Their body uses all the food, is nourished by all of the food that they're eating, and they produce less waste. Um, it will help with breath. It will help with their overall scent. Um, this may sound funny, but when furry guys come in the store, by petting them and sometimes by smelling them, because I can smell them when they get closer, I know that they're not eating even a quality kibble because their coats are very, very rough and almost greasy feeling and they've got that sweet scent to them. Do you know what I'm talking about? That is an indication of what they're eating that is probably not the best thing for them. And I can tell that by, by touching them, petting them, and, uh, and smelling them. Um, okay. I want to see. I bring credit for me. Okay. I'm just taking a look at the comments. Hello, Miss Caswell. Hello, Miss Katrina. Hello, Miss Maria. Hello, Tammy. Ellie can hear Zane barking. Maria, that's the part I screwed up. I'm going to have to go back and look to see which one this is. Um, okay, you guys, I appreciate you uh, popping on here with me. Whoa, way longer than I thought it was going to be. I hope this was helpful. Um, again, I, I, I want to be very clear, though, too, and, and make it known that I have all the respect in the world for our vets. Uh, and we have a ton of good vets in the city. Um, I understand some of the reasons why they want people not to feed a raw diet. And then on the other side of the house, they just, they need to focus on that medical side of the body. So nutrition isn't their, their primary focus, right? And they have a job to do, which is to sell the product that is in their store and their nutrition training was provided by the guys that also make that food. So keep that in mind. But the best thing that you could do as a pet parent is you can flip over that bag and take a look at the ingredients before we ever pour it into any of the floof bowls. Okay. If you guys have questions, you know where to find me. I appreciate you tuning in. I apologize for how long I went. If you've got questions, if you want something, if us to talk about something on Furry Friday, let me know. I, absolutely want to give you the information that you're looking for so have a great weekend you guys oh don't forget coat sale till the end of the month and your stockings if you haven't got them go on our website okay we'll talk to you later guys bye-bye